Let's begin with a prayer. God of justice, Prince of Peace, enter our lives this morning through your word and scripture, and through the realities of the world around us, and the deeper truths that we hold close to our hearts. Remind us to center our lives around you, for it is Christ who holds all things together and makes peace possible here and now. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and our redeemer. Amen. There is always some biting truth revealed in good-natured humor. And so when I heard Woody Allen's paraphrase of this morning's scripture reading, I paid attention. He offered this insight. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, but the lamb won't get much sleep. <laughs> and that may be what most of us are thinking when we hear this passage about a hoped-for impossible peace. The wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the kid, the lion and the fatling together, best friends, no longer predator and prey. And a little child shall lead them. Even to say, if you're the carnivore, taking a break from the battle of ways, it's easier to be the wolf than the lamb in this picture. Easy to wish for if someone else's child stands in danger's way. Because we know better. Lions are dangerous. And wolves eat lambs for lunch. They just do. It's a wonderful wish to think of God's kingdom come to earth in this way, that we might live in peace, not only with wild animal predators, but also with warring countries, with fighting neighbors, even with our own sometimes squabbling family members. The wolf and the lamb were powerful images for the Israelite society. The Israelite lands were surrounded by invading, aggressive, warring nations, much like today. And these neighbors either wanted to take dominion over the land or storm across it to reach enemies on the other side. The Israelites were afraid of the marauding wolves of their world, and they wanted God to protect them, ideally by defeating all their enemies. But through the prophet Isaiah, God promises them a different sort of protection, not the decimation of the enemy, but rather a peaceful coexistence with it. That outcome was probably not the people's first choice. It might not be our first choice either. Wouldn't it be easier if all our enemies disappeared, died away, our cantankerous colleagues at work, or that approval board that always says no. The political opponent. The bully that constantly wears us down, drains our spirits. But God promises that someday we're all going to get along just fine. The wolf and the lamb. You and your arch enemy. All creation. One glorious day, the wolf will live with the lamb. And everyone will get a good night's sleep. Isaiah was an Israelite writing centuries before the birth of Christ. He prophesied this enduring image of a docile animal kingdom. When Christians hear from this passage that this utopian, peace-filled animal land will be led by a little child, we immediately think of the Christ child we take this prophecy to be a prediction, a prediction of the Messiah's birth. It is one reason why this passage from Isaiah shows up every Advent and inspires us in our hopeful prayers for peaceful days ahead, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. But it's worth remembering that the original message from Isaiah was a prediction about a new political leader, 
someone who would be righteous, meaning knowledgeable about God's ways and faithful in following them. The ancient Israelites were hopeful for a new descendant of King David, a green shoot to grow out from the tree trunk of Jesse, the father of David, the house of the promised Messiah. A man named Hezekiah was the incoming ruler then, and the Israelites had high hopes for him that he would lead the people with justice and with faithfulness to God. He did not turn out to be the Messiah, but he was the hope for the day. Isaiah's message remains with us, despite its long-expired political aspect, for the promise remains. The wolf will live with the lamb in peace. The promise was not that the lambs would live all by themselves. Instead, the promise from God is that all of us lambs will live with our terrifying, murderous enemies because one day these enemies will be transformed. A famous depiction of Isaiah's vision of nature transformed was painted in the early 1800s by a Quaker artist from Pennsylvania called Edward Hicks. He painted the wild beasts described in our Isaiah passage lounging among stiff-jointed farm children at play. He entitled it the Peaceable Kingdom. In fact, he painted this scene 62 times over his lifetime. And each time the faces and fangs of the animals, the horns of the bull and the claws of the bear, seemed to grow sharper, as if Edward Hicks himself was starting to have doubts. Alongside the animal tableau, in the rural background of the same painting, one can see a gathering of men outdoors at a business meeting. There are eight colonially dressed Europeans, one of whom was William Penn opening steamer trunks and offering blankets to eight Native Americans wearing loincloths and feathered headdresses. Penn was an English real estate developer and a Quaker who founded the Pennsylvania province in 1620 through a land grant from the English king, Charles II. The king had never set foot in America and certainly did not own the land by modern measures but he owed a debt to Penn's father and grabbed title for the English realm. Essentially, the king struck a land deal with someone else's land, the, the Lenape Indian land, in fact, to pay off his debt. And Penn then took possession and successfully established the new Pennsylvania colony in America because he was able to bargain a peaceful coexistence with the native people. As shown in the painting, they accepted his gifts and gave the English settlers a lot of their land in return. Now, the painter Hicks was trying to illustrate a peace between the colonists and the Lenape people alongside the bucolic image of hope for a new creation. But we know better today. These European land deals were more like the first step towards the corruption and oppression of an indigenous people. And as Hicks continued to paint the scene over his lifetime and his animals grew more ferocious, I wonder if his understanding of the negotiations among Penn and the local Indians was changing as well. For as much as he and others had admired Penn, the ensuing colonial expansion made Penn look more like a wolf in sheep's clothing. And that wolf keeps waking up hungry and the lambs be they the Lenape Indians of 1620 or the native people of Standing Rock, North Dakota today, these lambs they dare not sleep at night. And therein lies the problem. The good intentions of one can mean disaster for another. The interests of one society are rarely in sync with the goals of another, even within one nation, one family. We have our own wolves and lambs. We even find ourselves in wolf and lamb mode from one day to the next. How do we manage these competing behaviors within our society, among our elected leaders, stamped across our diplomatic ties, even baked into our own personalities? The wolf, the 
lamb, and the Jekyll and Hyde reality of wolves who lurk in sheep's clothing. Where's the peace in that? How do we free ourselves of this Jekyll and Hyde conundrum and find a better life here and now? And here's another challenge. What do we do with the fact that God created lambs and wolves and called them both good? Remember the prophecy of Isaiah. The wolves won't be driven out. They will live with the lamb in peace. And the wolf, the predator, the aggressor, the bully, will no longer hurt a soul. He will be filled with righteous knowledge of the Lord. Then justice shall prevail, and nations will not learn war anymore. Maybe there is no getting over this Jekyll and Hyde divide. The wolf and the lamb are at war in the very heart of every human. It's our nature, our instability, our human weakness. We can be mean, angry, hurtful creatures at times, and we most often hurt the people we love the most, lashing out with angry words, overblown accusations. We've all done it. We might apologize and say, I'm hot-headed, it gets the better of me sometimes. I'm just that way. But God did not make us that way. God's not buying that excuse. God's asking more of us than giving in to the wolf that lurks within. Same for those of us who are too often victims. Unassuming and overridden by every wolf that comes along, we get beaten up again and again. We've been taught silence and acceptance in a way that makes us feel vulnerable and afraid whenever someone raises his voice or threatens to leave us or simply makes heavy-handed demands. Sometimes it's easier just to go along, to comply, to surrender our free spirits in order to survive. Our voices go quiet. We are diminished. Sheep to the slaughter. We can't find a way out. <coughs> and what do we do? We need God's promise of peace. We need to find that place of trust in God's promise that allows us to find an inner peace, first of all. Only then can we become the fully expressive people that God intended us to be, with the ability to be aggressive and to be vulnerable, to be courageous and to be weak, to be a sword and a shield, a leader of many, and a servant to all. For this, God gave us Jesus. God came to us as one of us and showed us what peace in the world can look like here and now. We can strive to be like Jesus, who turned the tables in the temple and wept over Jerusalem, who stood up to the Pharisees and stood down to a Syro-Phoenician woman who reminded him to heal even her, even the outsider. For mere fallen crumbs to puppies would be enough. The wolves will not be expelled from the kingdom, nor will the lamb. We need our lives to be transformed in order to find a way to live at peace within ourselves. Jekyll and Hyde, wolf and lamb, instead of looking outward for relief and bouncing back and forth from one extreme to another, our answer is in Christ, who holds all things together. Christ, the center of life and the giver of peace. The gift we receive at Christmas is the gift of Christ, the already happened incarnation that allows us to live at peace within ourselves and with God. To live as a Christian is to live with Christ at our center and to strive to live faithfully in Christ every day. The gift of Christ is what makes 
personal transformation possible, makes inner peace attainable, and promises joy. Isaiah shows us the peace at last kingdom of God, but the transformational ingredient that allows peace to reign in the kingdom, wolf and lamb, Jekyll and Hyde, is Christ, who enters our lives at this very table today and grants us, through the bread and the cup, a life transformed, the freedom of forgiveness, the centering of our spirits, and peace everlasting. Amen.